In this lecture, we will review two sample null hypothesis significance tests. This lecture has 10 objectives. One, distinguish independent from dependent samples. Two, measure and interpret effect size. Three, calculate a priori statistical power for a variety of two sample tests about the means and proportions using G-Power and calculators on the Statistics Kingdom website. Four, conduct a two-sample Z-test for independent means. Five, conduct a two-sample Z-test for independent proportions. Six, conduct an F-test for equality of variance to determine the appropriate two-sample T-test for independent samples. Seven, Conduct a two-sample t-test for independent means assuming equal variance. 8. Conduct a two-sample t-test for independent means assuming unequal variance. 9. Conduct a t-test for dependent samples. 10. Discuss practical and statistical significance. There are six basic two-sample tests. The first test is a two-sample test for independent means using z-values. The second test is a two-sample test for independent proportions using z-values. Then there are four tests using t or f distributions. For independent samples, there are three tests. The third test is the f-test for equality of variance. This is a very simple test. The results of this test indicate which of the two two-sample t-tests for independent means should be run. The fourth test is the first of the two two-sample t-tests for independent means. It is often called the pooled variance t-test. This test is used when the two sample variances are equal, which is to say that there is no statistically significant difference. The fifth test is the second of the two two-sample t-tests for independent means. This test is often called the unequal variance t-test. This test is used when the f-test for equality of variance shows the sample variances are unequal. And finally, the sixth test is the two-sample t-test for paired or dependent samples. Let's turn to the difference between independent and dependent samples. Independent samples are unrelated to one another. This means the measurements from one sample have no influence on the measurements of the other sample. Here are four examples of independent samples. The first example is the average daily commute times in New York City versus Chicago. The New York commute times have no influence on the commute times in Chicago and vice versa. The second example, average hours a day spent using a smartphone for baby boomers versus Generation Z. Baby boomers were born between 1945 and 1964 Generation Z was born between 1995 and 2010. Measurements for these samples, therefore, are independent. The third example, average annual repair costs for a 2015 Honda Accord versus the 2015 Toyota Camry. The fourth example, average starting salaries for college graduates majoring in business versus graduates majoring in the humanities. These samples are independent because the measure from one sample has no influence on the measure of the other sample. Dependent samples are related to each other. Measurements from one sample influence the measurements of the other sample. There are two types of dependent samples. The first are before and after tests. With before and after tests, two measures are made. The first happens before an intervention the second occurs after the intervention. This test is used to determine whether the intervention had an effect. Here are two examples of before and after tests. The grade point averages of students on academic probation before and after they complete a remedial program. Example two, brand sales before and after a product redesign. The second kind of dependent samples are matched pairs. With match pair tests, no intervention is made. An example of a match pair test would be the comparison of blood test results 
from the same group of patients measured by two different laboratories. Let's turn to the two sample test of independent means using Z values. Dr. V teaches two classes, one at 9 a.m. and another at 11 a.m. Students in the 11 a.m. classes seem to do better on the first examination than those in the 9 a.m. classes. Based on his grade books, he presumes the population variance for the 9 a.m. class is 350 and 250 for the 11 a.m. class. Remember, there are two requirements to use Z values. One, the population variances and population standard deviations must be known. Two, both samples must have at least 30 observations. If either of these conditions is not met, a two-sample t-test must be used. The research question. Do students in the 9 a.m. classes have lower average grades on the first exam than those in the 11 a.m. classes? The direction of this test is indicated by information embedded in the research question. The phrase lower average grades makes this a left-tailed test assuming the 9 a.m. class is listed before the 11 a.m. class in the null and alternate hypotheses. This would be a right tail test if the research question was, do students in the 11 a.m. classes have higher grades on the first exam than those in the 9 a.m. classes? Remember, Z values are assigned. The critical value for Z for a left tail test will be negative. The value of the test statistics should also be negative. An a priori statistical power calculation should be done to determine sample size. We will calculate a priori statistical power using the power calculator found on the Statistics Kingdom website. G Power lacks a calculator for this test. The Statistics Kingdom a priori power calculator has nine inputs. The first is tails. There are three options, left tail, two tails, and right tail. Select left tail. The second input is digits. This is the number of digits in the answer. The default is six, leave it at six. The third input is distribution. There are two options, normal and T. Because we will use Z values, select normal. The fourth input is sample. There are two options, one sample and two samples. Select two samples. The fifth input is significance level. Enter 0.05 for a 5% significance level. The sixth input is power. Enter 0.8 for 80% power. The seventh input is effect size. There are three options, small, medium, and large. Enter small. Most effect sizes tend to be small. The eighth input is effect type. There are two options, standardized or unstandardized. Effect size can be standardized or unstandardized. Unstandardized effect is sampling error and is in the units of the sample statistic. A standardized effect size are in standardized units. The advantage of a standardized effect size is that they are not based on the units used to measure the mean or proportion. Standardized effect size allow for comparisons of effect size regardless of the measurement scales. Cohen's D effect size is the most commonly used standardized effect size for means. This is the effect size measure we will use. The ninth input is effect size. Enter an estimate of 0.39. This is an estimate based on the researcher's judgment and the review of research literature. The selected effect size should be large enough for the test results to have practical significance. Based on experience, Dr. V estimates Cohen's D at 0.39, which is a small effect. Calculating Cohen's D effect size is a two-step process. The first step is to pool the standard deviations. This is the square root of the sum of the two standard deviations, assuming the two samples have equal sample size. If the two samples have unequal sample sizes, a weighted mean of the variances is used. The other formula is to pull standard deviations when there are more than two samples. We need not be concerned about those formulas when working with only two samples. The second step is to take the absolute value of the first mean minus the second mean over the pooled standard deviation. This table shows the Cohen-D's thresholds and their interpretation. 
As we have noted in other lectures, most effect sizes are small. Here is the screenshot of the Statistics Kingdom form showing the nine inputs. To achieve 80% statistical power, each sample must have 82 observations. Using his grade books for several years, Dr. V took a random sample of 82 students from his 9 a.m. classes and 82 students from his 11 a.m. classes. Here are the results. Here are the summary statistics. The average grade on the first exam was 76.918 for the 9 a.m. classes and 83.323 for the 11 a.m. classes. This is the difference between a C and a B. Are the samples independent? These samples are independent because a student cannot be registered in a 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. class, nor can a student's performance on an examination be affected by the performance of students in another class. Is a two-sample z-test appropriate? The data meets the first requirement for using z-values. Both samples have 30 or more observations. And the data meets the second requirement. There are good estimates of the two population standard deviations. Step 2. Select the significance level. As stated when the a priori power calculation was done, a 5% significance level has been selected. Finding the critical value for z. Using Excel, the critical value for z equals negative 1.645, found by entering the following function into Excel. Equal sign norm dot s dot inv open parentheses 0.05 close parentheses. Using the area under the curve table, the critical value for this left tail test is negative 1.65. The third step is to state the null and alternate hypotheses. The alternate hypothesis is based on the research question. The research question, do students in the 9 a.m. classes have lower average grades on the first exam than those in the 11 a.m. classes. This is a left tail test, assuming we place the 9 a.m. class before the 11 a.m. class in the hypotheses. The critical value of z will be negative. The null hypothesis. The population mean mu for the 9 a.m. class is greater than or equal to the population mean mu for the 11 a.m. class. The alternate hypothesis. The population mean mu for the 9 a.m. class is less than the population mean mu for the 11 a.m. class. Please note, the hypotheses should be written using mathematical notation as shown on the screen. Step four, compose the decision rule. Reject the null hypothesis if z is less than negative 1.645. The red tail on the chart marks the rejection region. Should the test statistic fall in this region, reject the null hypothesis. Step 5. Calculate the value of the test statistic, p-value, and effect size. Here is the formula for the test statistic for this test. In the numerator is the difference between the two sample means, or sampling error. This is also the unstandardized effect size. In the denominator is the standard error of the mean, the square root of the population variance for the 9 a.m. class over its sample size, plus the population variance from the 11 a.m. class over its sample size. Here is the value of the test statistic calculated by hand. Z equals negative 2.368, which we could round off to negative 2.37. We can find the p-value using either of the two area under the curve tables. The p-value is 0.0089 or 0.89%. Please note, if this were a two-tail test, the p-value would be 0.0178, found by two times 0.0089. Using Excel's data analysis tool is much faster than doing the calculations by hand and finding the p-value with the area under the curve table. This tool has four steps. Step one, click on the data analysis tool icon on the Excel ribbon. Step 2. Scroll down towards the end of the list until you see Z-Test, 2 sample for means. Highlight this tool and hit OK. Step 3. The data input screen appears. In variable 1 range, enter the cells for the 9 a.m. class by dragging the cursor through these cells. 
make certain that the data label in cell B1 is selected. In variable range 2, enter the range of cells for the 11 a.m. class. For the hypothesized mean difference, enter 0. For variable 1 variance known, enter the population variance for the 9 a.m. classes, 350. For variable 2 variance known, enter the population variance for the 11 a.m. classes, 250. Place a check in the labels box. Alpha is the significance level. Enter 0.05 for a 5% significance level. For the output option, select a place where you want the answers. In this example, cell J1 was selected. Excel will place the answer starting in this cell. Be careful when selecting an output option that you do not overwrite important data. Excel provides very precise answers. The downside to this is that it does not round the answers. The value of the z-test statistic is negative 2.3680099, which should be rounded off to negative 2.368. The p-value for this one tell test is 0 0.00894203, which we round off to 0 0.0089, or 0.89%. Please note, Excel also provides the p-value for a two-tailed test, which is double the p-value for a one-tailed test. In addition, Excel returns the critical values for one-tailed and two-tailed tests. Unfortunately, Excel returns the critical value for a right-tailed test. The critical value for a left-tailed test requires a negative sign. The big drawback of Excel's data analysis tool is that it fails to calculate effect size. Calculating the test statistic, p-value, and effect size are easy calculations using Excel's built-in functions. The value of z is negative 2.368. The p-value is 0 0.0089. And Cohen's d effect size is 0 0.5230. This is a bigger effect than the estimate used in the a priori power calculation. With an effect size of 52.30%, the difference in average test scores of 76.918 and 83.323 is a medium effect. Step 6. Decide and report. With a z-value as extreme as negative 2.368 and a p-value as low as 89%, there is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis at a 5% and 1% significance level. The test results have statistical significance. Conclusion, the 9 a.m. classes have lower average test scores. Do the results have practical significance? There is a medium effect size. The difference in average test scores is a C for the 9 a.m. classes and a B for the 11 a.m. classes. Students, faculty, and college administrators would agree that this difference has practical real-world significance. Let's turn to the two sample z-tests for independent proportions. The requirement for this test is the two samples must be independent. Please note, Excel's data analysis tool pack lacks a two sample z-test for proportions. In addition, there is no two sample t-test for proportions. Test limitations. We can only compare two samples with this z-test. We will compare the proportion of Republicans and independents who favor the legalization of marijuana. Not being able to compare more than two proportions from samples is a limitation of this test. In Chapter 11, we constructed confidence intervals for proportions using the October 2019 Gallup poll data on the attitudes of Republicans, Independents, and Democrats on the legalization of marijuana. Here are the poll results. 393 Republicans were included in this poll. 50.64%, or 199, favored the legalization of marijuana. 655 Independents were included in this poll. 67.79%, or 352, favored the legalization of marijuana. 352 Democrats were included in this poll, 78.22%, or 
or 352 favored the legalization of marijuana. The research question. Are Republicans less likely to favor the legalization of marijuana than independents? This is a left-tailed test, assuming we place Republicans before independents in the hypotheses. We should conduct an a priori statistical power calculation to answer the following question. Are the samples large enough to achieve 80% statistical power? We will use G power to calculate a priori statistical power. G power has nine inputs. The first input is test family. We will use z-test. The second input is the statistical test. Select proportions, difference between two independent proportions. The third input is type of power analysis. Select a priori, compute required sample size n given alpha, power, and effect size. The fourth input is tails. There are two options, one or two. Select one because this is a left tail test. The fifth input is proportion P2. This is the sample proportion for independence. Enter 0 0.6779. The sixth input is proportion P1. This is the sample proportion for Republicans. Enter 0 0.5064. The seventh input is alpha er prob. This is the significance level. Enter 0 0.05. The eighth input is power, 1 minus beta er prob. This is the desired level of statistical power. Enter 0 0.8 for 80% statistical power. The ninth input is allocation ratio, N2 over N1. Enter 2.23, found by the sample size for independents over the sample size for Republicans, 444 over 199. To achieve 80% statistical power, the sample must include 75 Republicans and 166 independents. Conclusion? Gallup sample sizes are more than adequate. This test will not be underpowered. Step 2. Select the significance level. As previously noted, a 5% significance level has been selected. We now need to find the critical value of Z. Remember, the critical value for Z for a left tail test will be negative. Using Excel's norm.s.inv function, the critical value of Z equals negative 1.645. This function has only one argument, the significance level, 0 0.05. Using the area under the curve table, the critical value for Z is negative 1.65. Step 3, state the null and alternate hypotheses. These hypotheses must reflect the research question. Are Republicans less likely to favor the legalization of marijuana than independents? To repeat, this is a left tail test, assuming that we place Republicans before independents in the hypotheses. The null hypothesis. The population proportion pi for Republicans is greater than or equal to the population proportion pi for independents. The alternate hypothesis. The population proportion pi for Republicans is less than the population proportion pi for independents. Remember, hypotheses are about population parameters. They take Greek letters. Step 4. State the decision rule. The decision rule. Reject the null hypothesis if z is less than negative 1.645. The area in red is the rejection region. Step 5. Calculate the value of the test statistic p-value, and effect size. The first step in calculating the value of the test statistic is to pull the sample proportions. This is a simple fraction. Pull proportion is the sum of the two successes over the sum of the two trials or sample sizes. In the numerator, add the two x values, 199 and 444. In the denominator, add the two sample sizes, 393 and 655. 643 over 1,048 equals 0 0.6135. The pool proportion is 61.35%. The second step is to complete the calculation of the test statistic. In the numerator is the difference between the two proportions, p sub 1 minus p sub 2. This is the sample error and the unstandardized effect size. The denominator is the standard error of the proportion. The square root of the pool proportion 
times one minus the pool proportion over the number of trials in sample one, plus the pool proportion times one minus the pool proportion over the number of trials in sample two. The pool proportion is 0 0.635. The test statistic equals negative 5.520. This is a very extreme Z value. Excel makes quick work of these calculations. To repeat, the Z value equals negative 5.520. The next step is to calculate the p-value using Excel. Given the extreme value of the test statistic, the p-value will be very tiny. The area under the curve table cannot find the p-value for such an extreme z-value. Here is the Excel function for the p-value. The p-value is 0 0.0000002. That's seven zeros after the decimal point. Such a tiny p-value is reported as less than 0 0.001. Finally, we calculate Cohen's H, which is the appropriate sample size for proportions. The formula for Cohen's H is the absolute value of phi 1 minus phi 2. Phi is found by 2 times the r sine times the square root of the proportions. Excel's sn function will make quick work of this calculation. The value of Cohen's H effect size for this test is 0 0.35. This figure indicates that we have uncovered a small effect relating to the impact of party identification and attitudes toward the legalization of marijuana. Yes, the difference of 17.15 percentage points between Republicans and independents' attitudes toward the legalization of marijuana is only a small effect. Here's the calculation of Cohen's H effect size in Excel. The absolute value of phi 1, 1.584 minus phi 2, 1.934 equals 0 0.35, which is a small effect. Step 6, decide and report. The last step is to make a decision and report the findings. With a Z value as extreme as negative 5.520 and a tiny P value of less than 0. 001, the null hypothesis is rejected. Conclusion. There is a statistically significant difference in the support for the legalization of marijuana between Republicans and independents. Independents are less likely to favor the legalization of marijuana. Do the results have practical significance? Yes. The findings of this test have practical, real-world implications for policymakers and entrepreneurs. The limitation of this test is that it compares only two samples, but there are three samples. Three tests are needed. Republicans versus Independents, Republicans versus Democrats, and Independents versus Democrats. Running three tests has a serious problem. Increased probability of a type 1 error. The probability of a type 1 error jumps from 5% to 14.26%. There is a sophisticated technique to counter the buildup of a type 1 error called a Bonaferroni correction. This technique is beyond the scope of an introductory statistics class. To avoid the increased risk of a type 1 error, a Bonaferroni correction divides the desired significance level by the number of multiple comparisons. This is a case where confidence intervals are more informative than a null hypothesis significance test. In Chapter 17, chi-square test will be introduced. These tests can compare more than two proportions. Let's turn to the F-test for equality of variance. This test is used to determine the equality or homogeneity of variance for two independent samples. The results of this test determine which of the two t-tests for independent means to use. We should also review the requirements for two sample t-tests for independent means. There are four requirements for two sample t-tests for independent means. One, the samples must be independent. Two, the population standard deviations or population variances are unknown for one or both samples. Or, three, one or both samples have a sample size less than 30. When the two samples have 30 or more observations and the population variances or population standard deviations are known, a z-test is used. Four, data for both samples are normally distributed or nearly normally distributed. Let's review how the equality of variance F-test is used to determine 
which of the two t-tests to use. When the variances are equal, when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we use a pooled variance t-test. When the two variances are not equal, when we reject the null hypothesis, we use an unequal variance t-test. The research question for the equality of variance f-test is do the two samples have equal variance? This sounds like a two-tailed test, but this is not a two-tailed test. All f-tests are right-tailed tests. The test statistic formula for this test is a simple fraction. The larger variance always goes in the numerator. The smaller variance always goes in the denominator. Placing the larger variance in the numerator forces the smallest possible value for f to be 1. This would mean that the two variances are identical. It also forces a right-tailed test. To repeat, f tests are always right-tailed tests. Here are four f distributions based on degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator. Note that each distribution is skewed to the right, but as the degrees of freedom increase, the skew decreases. Here are the null and alternate hypotheses. Null hypothesis. Population variance in the first sample is less than or equal to population variance in the second sample. Alternate hypothesis. Population variance in the first sample is greater than population variance in the second sample. To repeat, the sample with the larger variance is sample 1. This ensures that the value of f will be at least 1. The f-test statistic is a simple fraction. It is defined by three variables. 1. Degrees of freedom in the numerator. 2. Degrees of freedom in the denominator. 3. The chosen significance level, or alpha. The critical values tables for f are very big. Some combinations of degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator are missing. In addition, only two tables are readily available, one for a 5% significance level and the other for a 1% significance level. These tables cannot be used to estimate p-values. Use Microsoft Excel to overcome these limitations. Excel can find the critical value for any significance level and any combinations of degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator. Excel can also provide precise calculation of p-values. Here is the critical value table for f at a 5% significance level. And here is the critical values table for f at a 1% significance level. When using these tables, always double check to make certain that you're using the table that corresponds to the selected significance level. Here is how to use these tables. Step 1, select the table that matches the significance level. Step 2, find the degrees of freedom for the numerator, which are the column labels. Step 3, find the degrees of freedom for the denominator, which are the row labels. Step 4, the critical value for f is located at the intersection of the appropriate column and row. You can also find the critical value for f using Microsoft Excel's FINV function. This function has three arguments. One, the significance level. Two, degrees of freedom in the numerator. And three, degrees of freedom in the denominator. There are three advantages to using Microsoft Excel to find the critical values for f. First, it is fast and easy. Second, there are no missing combinations of degrees of freedom. Third, it can calculate the critical value for f for any significance level, not just 5% and 1%. Let's review the pooled variance t-test for independent means. This test requires the use of the f-test for equality of variance. We will conduct a pooled variance t-test when the f-test for equality of variance shows the variances are roughly equal. Remember, t-tests are used when one or both samples have unknown population standard deviations or variances, or one or both have fewer than 30 observations. The data for both samples are normally distributed or nearly normally distributed. Step 1, Test Setup. The Nunya School of Business is testing a new introductory accounting textbook. The new textbook is assigned to half of the Accounting 1 classes. The current textbook is assigned to the other half. At the end of the semester, students took the same standardized test. Research question. Do students who are assigned a new textbook score higher on the standardized test? This is a right-tailed test based on the phrase scored higher. 
Because there is not a good estimate of the population variances, a two-sample z-test for the means cannot be used. But which two-sample t-test should be used? The pooled variance test or the unequal variance test? The proper two-sample t-test will be decided based on whether the samples have roughly equal variances. To answer this question, the researchers must conduct an F-test for equality of variance. An a priori statistical power calculation will be done for the t-test, not the f-test for equality of variance. Here are the data for the two samples. Each sample has 115 observations. The data were collected before the a priori statistical power calculation. If this test lacks sufficient power, additional data must be added to the samples. A 5% significance level has been selected for the equality of variance f-test. Here are the null and alternate hypotheses. The null hypothesis. Variance from the first sample is less than or equal to variance from the second sample. To repeat, the first sample has the larger variance. The alternate hypothesis. Variance from the first sample is greater than variance in the second sample. Here are the three steps for running the equality of variance test using Excel's data analysis tool. First, click on the data analysis icon on Excel's ribbon. Second, scroll down to the F-Test 2 sample for variance. Highlight this option and click on the OK button. Third, the data input window appears. Enter the data inputs. Enter variable 1 and variable 2 data ranges. Include the cell's data labels. Remember, the larger sample variance must go in variable 1 range. Check the box that says Labels. Under alpha, enter the selected significance level, which is 0.05. And finally, select the output option. To repeat, the larger variance must go in variable one range. A major weakness in Excel's data analysis tool is that it does not automatically do this. Failing to place the larger variance in variable range one will result in a serious error. The value of the F-test statistic will be less than one. Here is an example of this problem. Variable 1 is the new textbook, which has a smaller variance than the current textbook. As a result of this error, the F-score is less than 1, which, as we have shown, is not possible. An Excel workbook that uses if statements can fix this problem. The if statements will always place the sample with the larger variance in the numerator. Here is a screenshot of an Excel worksheet that uses if statements to ensure that the larger variance is always placed in the numerator, f equals 1.129. The worksheet also reports the p-value, 25.98%, and a decision for the equality of variance test. The null hypothesis is not rejected. Consequently, the appropriate t-test is the pooled variance t-test. To repeat, we must conduct a pooled variance t-test. Excel calls this test t-test two sample assuming equal variance. We will now calculate a priori statistical power using G power. G power has eight inputs. The first input is test family, T test. The second input is statistical test, means, difference between two independent means, two groups. The third input is type of power analysis. Select a priori, compute sample size given alpha, power, and effect size. The fourth input is tails. There are two options, one and two. Select one because this is a right tail test. The fifth input is effect size D. This is the estimated Cohen's D effect size. Enter an estimated effect size of 0.33. The sixth input is alpha er prob. This is the selected significance level. Enter 0.05. The seventh input is power. 1 minus beta er prob. This is the desired level of statistical power. Enter 0.8 for the desired 80% statistical power. The eighth input is allocation ratio N2 over N1. This is the ratio of the two sample sizes. For this test, the ratio is 1 because both samples will have the same number of observations. Here is the completed a priori statistical power calculation. To achieve 80% power, assuming an effect size of 0.33, each sample requires 115 people. To repeat, 
This is a right tail test based on the research question. Do students using the new textbook have significantly higher test scores on a standardized accounting examination? Here is a chart of the T distribution. The area on the right tail is the rejection region. Step two, select the significance level. A 5% significance level has been selected. Find the critical value for T using the student T table. Degrees of freedom are found by adding the two sample sizes and subtracting the number of independent samples, which are two. There are 228 degrees of freedom found by 115 plus 115 minus two. The critical value for this right tail test with 228 degrees of freedom and a 5% significance level is 1.652 found using the student T table. Here is the critical value for a right tail T test with 228 degrees of freedom using Excel. Step three, state the null and alternate hypotheses. Null hypothesis, mu sub n is less than or equal to mu sub c, where mu sub n is the population mean for the new textbook and mu sub c is the population mean for the current textbook. Alternate hypothesis, mu sub n is greater than mu sub c. The alternate hypothesis is the mathematical expression of the research question. Step four, compose the decision rule. Reject the null hypothesis if t is greater than 1.652. Step five, calculate the test statistic, p-value, and effect size. You can calculate the test statistic in two steps. Step one, calculate pooled variance using this formula shown on the screen. For this test, pooled variance equals 92.68. Step two, calculate the test statistic. The test statistic is sample mean for the first sample minus the sample mean for the second sample over the square root of pooled variance times one over the sample size for the first sample plus one over the sample size for the second sample. The value of the t-test statistic is 9.219, which is extremely large. The value of the test statistic and p-value can be calculated using Excel's data analysis tool. There are four steps. Step one, click on the data analysis icon on Excel's ribbon. Step two, in the data analysis window, scroll down until you see the test label t-test, two sample assuming equal variances. Select this test and hit OK. Step three, enter the inputs. In the input window, enter variable one range by highlighting every cell that includes a variable in the first sample. Be certain to include the data label. Repeat this step for variable two. Hypothesized mean difference should be zero, enter zero. Check the labels box. Under alpha, enter the significance level, 0 0.05. Lastly, select the output range. Step four, read the output. The average score for students using the new textbook is 85.68 versus 73.97 for those using the current textbook, nearly a 12 point increase. The value of t is 9.219. Again, this test statistic is extremely high. The p-value is extremely low. We report such tiny p-values as less than 0.001. To repeat, Excel's weakness is that it fails to calculate Cohen's d effect size. We can, of course, set up an Excel worksheet that will calculate Cohen's d effect size along with the critical value of t the value of the test statistic, and the p-value. Here is a screenshot from such a worksheet. The value of Cohen's h is 0 0.30, which is a small effect. Please note, this effect size is smaller than the effect size used to estimate statistical power. But given the extreme z-value and p-value, this is not a problem. The critical value for this test found using Excel's built-in functions is 1.652. The value of the test statistic is 9.219. With such a large test statistic, the p-value is extremely small, far less than 0.001. We report this p-value as less than 0.001. Step six, decide and report. With such an extreme t-value and p-value, there is strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Students using the new textbook perform significantly better 
on a standardized test than those using the current textbook. Do we have practical significance? The results have practical significance because students went from an average score of 73.97 to an average of 85.66. With the nearly 12 point increase, the average grade on the standardized exam went from a C using the current textbook to a B using the new textbook. Let's turn to the unequal variance t-test. This test is also known as the Welsh's t-test. The first step is test setup. Jittery Joe and Caffeine Carl are brothers who own competitive espresso stands at opposite ends of a very large mall. Their sibling rivalry is very intense. They argue incessantly about whose stand is more successful. You are hired to settle the argument. You are handed the sample data which contains daily sales for 66 days for each beverage stand. Before you look at the data, you tell the brothers that you should perform an a priori statistical power calculation to determine the sample size. And this calculation should be done before the data are collected. You also tell the brothers that the power calculation is based on the direction of the test, the probability of a type 1 and type 2 error, and Cohen's d effect size. In private conversations, each brother tells you to use the data, and you should run the a priori power analysis if you wish. Both insist that the effect size will be huge. You tell them that you will estimate effect size at 0.50, which is a medium effect. But you also warn them that once you review the data, this calculated statistical power could easily change. And then you say that you are concerned that the test will be underpowered. You quickly calculate the summary statistics. You immediately notice two things. One. There is only a $1.26 difference in the average daily sales. Two, caffeine Carl sales have much higher variance than Jittery Joe's sales. Variance for caffeine Carl sales is more than twice that of Jittery Joe's sales. Given the tiny difference in average daily sales, you are convinced that the data will have a negligible effect and the test will be grossly underpowered. Which test is appropriate? The samples are independent. Sales from one stand do not affect sales from the other stand. The population variances are unknown. Hence, the z-test for two independent means cannot be used. A two-sample t-test for independent means, therefore, should be used. The question now is which t-test for independent samples should be used. An f-test for equality or homogeneity of variance will answer this question. Using the Excel workbook that uses if statements, to place the higher variance in the numerator, you run the f-test for equality of variance. With 65 degrees in freedom in both the numerator and denominator, the critical value for f is 1.51. The value of the f-test statistic is 2.097, found by 31,982.57 over 15,253.238. The p-value at 0.0016 is tiny. There is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Conclusion, the two samples do not have equal variances. The unequal variance t-test should be used. The unequal variance t-test reduces the degrees of freedom. The formula used to reduce degrees of freedom is time-consuming to calculate by hand. Reducing the degrees of freedom raises the critical value and makes it harder to reject the null hypothesis. As a result, this test has lower statistical power than the pooled variance t-test. The research question, is there a significant difference in daily sales for the two espresso stands? The word difference indicates a two-tailed test. Two-tailed tests have more extreme critical values than one-tailed test. As a result, two-tailed tests have less statistical power than one-tailed tests. As previously stated, an a priori statistical power analysis should have been performed before the data were collected. Let's assume that there is a medium effect size, 0.50. This assumption is based on the brother's claim that there is a big effect size. This is, as we shall see, a very risky assumption. Assuming a Cohen's d effect size of 0.50, each sample should have 64 observations to achieve 80% statistical power. Here is a screenshot of the g-power inputs and the a priori statistical power calculation. Based on the assumption previously mentioned, 
Both samples need 64 observations. Step 2. Select the significance level. A 5% significance level has been selected. Calculate the adjusted degrees of freedom using this formula. If your answer is not a whole number, round up to the next highest whole number. Completing this formula takes time, and your answer should be triple checked. Should your answer be a fractional number, round up to the next highest number. The answer is 115.51, which rounds up to 116 degrees of freedom. Note, Excel's data analysis tool will calculate the reduced degrees of freedom automatically. The critical values can be found using Excel's t.inv function. This function has two arguments, one, the significance level, and two, degrees of freedom. The critical value for a two-tailed test at a 5% significance level with 116 degrees of freedom are negative 1.81 and positive 1.81. You can also find the critical values using the student t table. Step 3. State the hypotheses. The research question implies a two-tailed test. Null hypothesis, mu sub j equals mu sub c, where mu sub j is the average daily sales for Jittery Joe, and mu sub c is the average daily sales for Kathleen Carl. Alternate hypothesis, mu sub j does not equal mu sub c. Step 4. Compose the decision rule. The decision rule. Reject the null hypothesis if t is less than negative 1.981 or greater than positive 1.981. Step 5. Calculate the value of the test statistic, p-value, and effect size. Here are the results of this test using Excel's data analysis tool. There is only a $1.26 difference in the average daily sales. This tiny difference is not enough to buy anything at either stand. The value of the t-test statistic is tiny, only 0.047. The p-value is huge, 96.26%. To repeat, Excel's data analysis tool fails to calculate Cohen's d effect size. We can, however, use Excel to calculate Cohen's d. The value of Cohen's d is extremely small. 0.0021. In fact, there is no effect. It is nowhere near the 0.50 used to calculate a priori statistical power. This test is grossly underpowered. Step 6. Decide and report. With a tiny test statistic of 0.047 and a huge p-value of 96.26%, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. There is absolutely no evidence that the two stands do not have equal sales. The tiny value of Cohen's d, 0.021, is another indication of no difference. Do we have practical significance? Practical significance is often a judgment call. This test might have practical significance if, after learning that there is no significant difference in their daily sales, the brothers stop bickering. How large should the samples be if an effect size of 0.0021 were used in the a priori power calculation? With such a tiny sample size, the sample would need over 3.5 million days to achieve 80% power. That's over 9,752 years of data. In Genesis, Methuselah, the oldest person in the Old Testament, lived to an age of 969. This test would have to run 10 Methuselah lifetimes. Impossible. Conclusion, such a test should not have been run. The last two sample test is the t-test for dependent samples. This test has two requirements. First, the two samples must be dependent, which is to say, measurements from one sample affect measurements from the other sample. Two, the data must approximate a normal distribution. Step one, test setup. The CEO of Ivy League Test Prep wants to determine whether clients who completed the company's SAT program increased their SAT scores. Given the research question, have clients increased their SAT scores, this is a right tail test. This is a dependent sample t-test because it measures performance before and after an intervention. The intervention is completing the Ivy League Test Prep program. The next step is to determine the required sample size by calculating a priori statistical power.
This calculation will be performed using G-Power. There are seven inputs. The first setting is test family, which is t-test. The second input is the appropriate test. For this problem, it is statistical test, difference between two dependent samples match pairs. The third input is type of power analysis. Select a priori, compute the required sample size. The fourth input is tails. There are two options, one and two. Select one because this is a right tail test. The fifth input is effect size. This is the estimated Cohen's D effect size. The effect size is estimated by looking at similar studies and considering the size of the effect needed to achieve practical significance, enter 0.43, which is a small effect. The sixth input is alpha ER prob, which is the significance level. This is the researcher's tolerance of a type 1 ER, enter 0.05. The seventh input is statistical power, or the tolerance of a type 2 error of false negative. This is an important input for the a priori statistical power calculation. Following the 520 convention, the probability of a type 2 error is set at 20%, so the desired level of statistical power is 80%. Enter 0 0.8 for 80% statistical power. Here is the g-power output. 35 match pairs are required to achieve 80% power. Here is a random sample of 35 SAT scores from Ivy League test prep clients. The table has three columns. The first column shows the client's SAT scores after they completed the test prep program. The second column shows clients' SAT scores before they completed the program. The third column marked D shows the difference in SAT scores found by after minus before. A positive D means the client's scores increased. A negative score means the client's scores decreased. Here are the summary statistics for the 35 match pairs. The average SAT score before students took the test prep program was 967.886. The average score after completing the program was 987.457. This is an increase of 19.571 points. The sample standard deviation after completing the program was 95.063, a modest decline from the before standard deviation of 100.737. Step 2. Select the significance level. As indicated with the statistical power calculation, a 5% significance level has been selected. Degrees of freedom is found by the number of match pairs minus 1. Using the student t-table, the critical value for a right tail test at a 5% significance level with 34 degrees of freedom is 1.691, as shown on this section of the student T critical values table. We can also find the critical value of T using Excel. The formula for the right tail test is equal sign ABS open parentheses T dot INV open parentheses significance level comma degrees of freedom comma close parentheses, close parentheses. The ABS or absolute function must be included because Excel calculates the critical value of T and Z starting from the extreme left of the distribution. If the ABS function is not included, the critical value will be negative, which is for a left tail test. Step three, state the null and alternate hypotheses. Null hypothesis, mu sub D, the mean of the differences between the after and before SAT scores is less than or equal to zero. Alternate hypothesis, mu sub d is greater than zero. Step four, compose the decision rule. The decision rule, reject the null hypothesis if t is greater than 1.691. The red tail on the right is the rejection region. Step five, calculate the test statistic, p-value, and effect size. Excel's data analysis tool can calculate the value of the test statistic and p-value. There are four steps. Step one, click on the data analysis icon on Excel's ribbon. Step two, in the data analysis window, scroll down until you see the test label t-test. Paired two sample for means, select this test and click OK. Step three, the input screen appears. Under variable range one, Enter the range of cells for after. You can do this by dragging the cursor through the range of cells. Be certain to include the cell with the label after.
under variable range 2 enter the range of cells for before. For a hypothesized mean difference enter the number 0. Check the labels box. Alpha is the significance level enter 0 0.05. For the outputs option cell H1 was selected. Excel will place the results of the analysis starting in cell H1. Click OK and Excel will quickly report the results. Step 4. Interpret the results. Excel provides the summary statistics. Average SAT scores went from 967.89 to 987.44, an increase of only 19.57 points. Ignore Pearson's correlation. Pearson's correlation will be reviewed in detail in Chapter 18 on Linear Correlation and Regression. The calculated value of the t-test statistic is 2.610. Please note, the results should be rounded off to three digits past the decimal point. Excel provides the p-values for one and two tail tests. The p-value for this right tail test is 0.67%, which is quite low. Excel also provides the critical values for one and two tail test. The critical value for this right tail test is 1.691. As we have repeatedly noted, Excel does not calculate Cohen's D effect size. We can calculate Cohen's D effect size using Excel. The formulas are simple. There are two formulas for calculating Cohen's D effect size. The first is the value of the test statistic T over the square root of N. The second is D bar over S sub D, the mean of the differences between the two samples over the standard deviation of the differences. Cohen's D effect size is 0.44, which is still a small effect. Here is the test statistic calculation done using Excel. The test statistic is 2.610. The p-value is 0.0067 or 0.67%. The test statistic can also be calculated by hand. There are three formulas to calculate the test statistic. One, finding D-bar the mean of the differences between the after and before samples. Two, finding S sub D, the standard deviation of these differences. And three, calculating the value of the test statistic. First, calculate D bar. D bar is the sum of the differences between the pair samples over the total number of paired samples. D bar equals 19.571 points. This is the average mean increase in SAT scores. Second, Calculate the standard deviation of the differences. S sub D equals 44.364. Finally, calculate the value of the t-test statistic, 2.610. This formula is similar to the formulas of other test statistics. In the numerator is sampling error, in the denominator is the standard error of the mean. Step 6. Decide and report. With the t-test statistic as high as 2.610, and a p-value as low as 0.67%, we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis at a 5% and 1% significance level. The 19.57 point gain in SAT scores is statistically significant. Completing the program helps students increase their SAT scores. But the question remains, does a slightly less than 20 point improvement in average SAT scores have practical significance? While the effect size of 0.44 is not negligible, the average improvement in SAT scores of just under 20 points will most likely not impress college admissions committees. This is a case where the results are statistically significant but lack practical significance. Except where otherwise noted, clear-sighted statistics is licensed under a Creative Commons license. You are free to share derivatives of this work for non-commercial purposes only. Please attribute this work to Edward Volchak. You can access clear-sighted statistics for free along with its Excel and PowerPoint files on the CUNY Commons. The URL is https forward slash forward slash cuny dot manifold app dot org forward slash projects forward slash clear dash cited dash statistics.